Hey there fellow Planeswalkers, it's Steve for Collector Mania. So I'm here to introduce you to our new series called Popper to Power. Um, essentially this is a way for us to implement a challenge league into our gameplay. Uh, what we're trying to do basically is take a Popper Commander deck and then through a series of challenges, I think it's like six games, we're going to upgrade that deck slowly into a regular Commander deck. Um, we're using this as mostly a vehicle to kind of show you guys uh, maybe a little bit of like deck building process, also a just a different way to play the game. Um, really, <laughs> we are looking at it more of like a teaching moment, I guess. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to take this and run a league on it, that would be totally cool. I'm sure it would work perfectly. Um, so jumping into it here, I've got a nice little sheet here that you can see on screen. Uh, it might be a little small, I apologize, but I'll go ahead and read it over for you guys. So. Each player starts out with a popper commander, so that's any uncommon creature. Um, keep in mind that does not have to be legendary. There are quite a few, there's about a list of 30 that are legendary, so if you actually want to add that into your playgroup as another restriction, you can. I actually prefer a lot of restrictions. It, I, to me, it breeds creativity, so that's always cool to me. Um, let's see, where am I? And a deck of 99 common cards, of course. That's a regular popper commander deck. Uh, da -da -da -da. Each player, and this is kind of specific to ours, is able to upgrade through from week to week. So if we want to jump down here a little bit to the upgrade section here. So week one is a Popper Commander deck, okay? So what we've already talked about. Week two is actually being an upgrade from Popper to Peasant. So essentially what that means is that uncommons are now allowed in your deck. And the way that we're going to try and put a restriction on that is based on the amount of points you got from the previous game, that's how many cards you can add. So if you look at the chart here, one uncommon is actually worth one point. So if you get the lowest maximum points, which it, or lowest possible points, I should say, in your gameplay, which is 13, you can only upgrade 13 uncommons. If you get the highest, which I don't even, I haven't calculated that out yet, but depending, it could be 16, 18, 20, who knows. Um, then you are now allowed to add 20 uncommons to your deck. Yeah, it's going to add a little bit of disparity in power, but it's also going to add like a little bit of a risk factor for us. That way, it's like, oh, is Steve going to make it because he totally lost his butt last time and he can only add 13 uncommons? Yeah. <laughs> so the week after that, week three, upgrade your peasant commander deck to a commander deck. So basically all we're doing there is we're switching probably our uncommon card, unless it's legendary, to a regular commander deck. This kind of brings it full, full circle into like the regular commander thing. But your deck's basically still going to be themed off of commons and uncommons. So it's still a little bit different, still a little bit like watered down commander but still I mean there's a lot of really powerful uncommons and commons are out there you gotta realize that as well um, so week four rares and mythics are allowed so this is where the points really start adding up because if you look at the chart once again so a rare upgrade is three points so you may have to start saving those or you may really just try and win as much as you can or get as many of those points as you can just to fit as many rares as you can into your deck because obviously that's gonna make it more powerful then also we've got mythic upgrades at five so Let's see here. The week after that, week five, rares and mythics allowed in main deck based off points earned. So we're just going through two weeks of that. And then week six, finalize your deck to your preference. So this is kind of where we take the chains off and you get to build whatever commander deck you want. I'm hoping at the end of that, by week six, we've actually really gotten there. Um, maybe just a few upgrades here or there. But I kind of want to just really show like what you are capable of doing when you're kind of... Uh, I guess narrowly channeled into something like this where you're, you've you got a point system that you have to upgrade by and you have restrictions on what you can add and what you can take out and stuff like that because there's another rule on here that says once a card goes in essentially it's locked so if you throw an uncommon in that's not a good choice you're kind of stuck with it and hopefully you can make it a good choice. <laughs> so let's take a look here at the point system really quick. Um, so each player starts a game with 10 points so we kind of implemented this in a way as a way for players not to get totally boned, you know, because we don't want to like have two really, really powerful decks by the end of this and like have two people stuck with a bunch of commons and not having a great time. So 10 points, you should probably be able to get away with that anyway. And then we've got defeating the players with two points, so that's pretty good. You know, you knock someone out, you get two extra points, that brings you up to 12 already. Then we've got a game, game's winner receives five points, so you really want to win. <laughs> Here, I'm going to focus the camera really quick. There we go. Much better. Um, let's see here. Dealing first blood earns you a point, so that's always good. Oh, I, I guess I should go through the game winners. Um, second place gets you three points. Third place, 
third and fourth place gets you two points as well. So at minimum, you're going to end up with 12 points regardless of how you play the game. If you get knocked out in like the first five turns, you should end up with at least 12 points. Um, dealing first blood earns you one point. Casting your commander for the first time each game gets you a point, so minimum 13, I would assume. Playing your 15th land earns you a point. Casting your commander for the fifth time earns you two points. Winning a game without casting your commander gets you two points, so you kind of lose one point but gain two if you don't cast your commander. Uh, defeating two or more players in one turn earns you two additional points. Defeating a player with a commander damage earns you two points, and if you don't know, commander damage is a little bit different in Popper. We'll probably keep this until for at least the two weeks. Essentially, it's at 16 points instead of 21 points, so you'll see that might factor into a few people's commander choices later on. Um, let's see here. Some detractors, essentially things that'll lose you points, is searching your deck for longer than 60 seconds loses you two points. I've always liked this rule because it kind of keeps the game flowing. I mean, you really don't want to sit there and watch somebody search their deck for like two minutes. <laughs> we may even lower the time on this, like maybe 30 seconds or something like that. Keep in mind, this is still kind of a working list, so we're still trying to improve things and implement other rules. And then repeating a combo more than three times in one turn loses you one point per loop. Um, essentially, that rule is just there for people that are really gunning for like points, just trying to get that extra five points for winning, and just that's all they really care about. We that's not really what we're focused on. We're focused on like the gameplay and the challenge and like having fun with it. So that's just a rule I try and implement in pretty much every commander thing I try and do anyway. So there's that. Um, da -da -da, the player with the least amount of points earned in the previous game actually gets to go first the next game. Kind of give them a little bit of a leg up. Um, you know, maybe somebody just lost because they didn't get a chance to do their stuff. They just died too early or something like that. So a little bit of, uh, I guess, fair making. I don't even know what to call it. <laughs> and then we've got a house rule, which essentially says inappropriate comments made by Greg loses him one point. Actually, inappropriate comments made by anybody loses Greg one point. So that's really interesting. We probably won't actually make it that way, but it's kind of a fun little include. Um, so anyway, that is in a nutshell popper to power. Um, obviously we did this with the intent of you guys being able to do this at home as well. So if you guys want to screenshot this list or whatever and take from it or just, you know, make a mental note of what you like and what you don't like. I highly recommend just getting a play group together and then trying this. It's a blast. It really is. We've uh, gone through the first game. I won't tell you the results yet. You'll have to watch the game to find out. But yeah, it was a ton of fun. I'm ready to upgrade. I'm ready to add cards and take cards out and see what happens there. So anyway, um, this will probably jump, jump right into my interview for what I'm playing. So I will see you there. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoy the interviews and then the gameplay right after it. Thanks, guys. Bye. Let's go over a few cards in my deck quickly. I am running Ruthless Deathfang as my commander. So if you haven't seen him before, he's a four colorless blue, black, 4-4 uh, four, four Flying Dragon. Whenever you sacrifice a creature, target opponent sacrifices a creature. So I pretty much focused on this creature because it, one, has evasion, and two, it's actually pretty sizable. And if you don't know, the commander damage is actually a little bit different in Popper. I think it's 16 or something like that. It's a lot lower than normal. Um, also, it's got a removal effect right on the card, and since I'm playing blue-black, there's a lot of, like, recursion-based things going on in my deck. So we'll kind of jump into those really quick. Uh, first up, I've got Corpse Holler, and this pretty much epitomizes my entire deck, my entire strategy. So we've got a colorless and a black, Human Rogue, 2-1, that has two colorless and a black, sacrifice Corpse Holler, return, tar return another target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. So it's getting that trigger for you to cause somebody else to sacrifice a creature, but it's also recurring a creature from your graveyard. So a bunch of, like, recycling things going on here. Next up, we've got a Brine Shaman. <laughs> I was super surprised when I found this card, so when I was going through popper cards that said sacrifice essentially so it's a colorless and a black 1-1 one, one. Uh, cleric I'm guessing probably human has tap sacrifice creature to give target creature plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn so keep in mind I can make my commander 6-6 six, six on demand or I can even pump somebody else's commander if I want to finish somebody else off it also has a colorless 2 blue sacrifice a creature to counter target summon spell so I can counter like creature spells like other commanders and so on and so forth now we've got a Moriot, Moriot Replica. <laughs> I think I'm saying that right. Three colorless artifact creature warrior, 2-2, two, two, that has right on it. Pay a colorless and a black, sacrifice it, you draw two cards and lose two life. So once again, a lot of synergy there with my commander. 
Now we've got Alter's Reap, of course. Sacrifice a creature, draw two cards, instant speed. Perfect. And we've got Gurmag Angler. So this is another, I guess, direction the deck can go into. Really just using your graveyard to fuel your bigger spells. And as as we jump up in rarities, you'll really start seeing that when I start adding a lot of like super crazy delve cards and so on and so forth. I wish uh, Treasure Cruise wasn't banned in this format, but it's probably banned for a good reason. So <laughs> anyway, six colors and a black five five that has delve. So just a big zombie fish. Now we've got White of Precinct 6, so this gets a plus one plus one counter for, or not a counter, gets plus one plus one for each creature in ever, each of your opponent's graveyards. So pretty powerful there. And then we've got Tragic Slip, of course. How could I not include that? And then last up, I've got Unearth. So this is really the only straight from graveyard to battlefield reanimate spell that I have right now, but just imagine the kind of, I guess, deck I'm heading towards, you know. Sacrifice your creatures, recur your creatures, sack them again for crazy effects. And that's essentially my deck in a nutshell, and that's what I'm trying to do. So I hope you guys enjoyed that, and stick with me. We'll get the full deck list up probably here pretty soon. It'll probably be in the description or on Tapped Out somewhere like that. We'll figure it out either way. Okay, see you in the game. Hey Planeswalkers, welcome to my interview for Wolf Skull Shaman. Back in the day, I used to play a wolf-themed elf deck in Lorwyn Standard, so I figured I'd return to this guy. He's always been one of my favorites. Here, the ability here is Kinship. Um, at the beginning of Upkeep, you may look at the top card of your library. If it shares a creature type, either elf or shaman, I get a 2-2 wolf into play. The idea here is that there's going to be a lot of elves, a lot of shaman, and hopefully later some creature type manipulation, just so I can get more and more successful Kinship triggers, I guess. Uh, we'll break into our first card we have rune stalactite here's a like a very simple example of that if you look uh equip creature has plus one plus one and gains each creature type so now i can if i've got this on my commander uh place some different creature types in the deck that aren't elves or shamans or whatever and get the kinship trigger off any creature revealed so definitely a cool one really easy to play and equip as well fertilid of course for some good land ramp uh, i always feel comfy using it just because the last thing you want to do is be behind on mana um, and especially in Popper, when you're probably just going to maybe play one or two cards a turn, if you're stuck on mana and you can't do something, that is bad news. Uh, next we have Lignify. Some, some decent removal. You know, they get an 0-4 on the board, which may or may not be great, but losing all abilities can really help, especially with stuff like Steve's deck. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if that comes into play. Next we've got Wrap, wrap in Vigor. Regenerate each creature you control. Just hopefully making things a little bit more like survivable I guess especially when swinging through to try and kill somebody maybe defensively if you need to help protect and like quadruple block or something you can take something really big out and not lose everything in, in that block uh, next we got undergrowth scavenger here um, power equal to number of plus one plus one counters on all creatures and all graveyards so a big finisher there and then elvish herder a single green gives a creature trample so if we've got a bunch of little guys that are maybe even just two twos or something uh, blocking or blocked by a whole bunch of one ones that's a threat or even just one dude um, definitely a good finisher there especially later I think giving even a okay rare trample for a single green could end the game for somebody uh, we've got wild heart invoker a little bit of a different run on him. Uh, he's got an activated ability for 8, which gives plus 5, plus 5 and trample until end of turn. Hopefully I'll have the mana for that, especially with elves, and especially later on with some improvements to the deck. And I think our last one here, we have Timber Ma, Timber Ma Larva. When he attacks, he gets plus 1, plus 1 for each forest I control. So if he's coming in, swinging on, let's say, turn 5, I haven't missed a land drop, he's going to be a 7-7 seven, seven on his first attack. Um, so, pretty decent card. Uh, hopefully all this will come together and make a wolfy kinshipy time. We'll see and check out the gameplay. How's it going, Planeswalkers? This is Kylie Fortner from Collector Mania uh, YouTube channel. Um, I am here discussing my Popper to Power EDH deck, uh, maining Miss Metal Witch as my commander uh, because I think that flicker effects and bounce effects are going to be very powerful in a common style game with a lot of enter the battlefield effects being my focus. So the first one, you know, you have Miss Metal Witch and for four mana she bounces until end of turn and that's actually really important. I was going over the deck the first time and I thought I had an infinite combo and then I was like, wait, no, I'm good because it's until end of turn. So <clears throat> just to keep going through, 
good enter the battlefield triggers is going to be core core cartographer if i can speak um it's gonna search me for a planes it's gonna put it right onto the battlefield in blue and white that's really difficult so that's definitely something that i wanted to make sure i had in the deck was a lot of ways to do that i also have um that artifact that searches a play, uh, land and puts it in your hand so definitely want to make sure that i'm not missing any land drops um, on top of that moly d mole drifter um, definitely a great card especially since you want to make sure it, it, for four mana every turn i can draw two cards that's pretty good in a common deck theme so um, definitely worth it if for no other reason just because of my commander uh, Archaeomancer is going to go back and get me some really important cards that are going to help me keep the game manageable. I do think that people are going to start going a little bit faster than I am. Um, just because blue-white and common, it's difficult to catch up to everyone sometimes. But I do have a couple cards that are going to slow people down as sorceries and instants. Um, and I want to make sure that I can keep getting them back. And again, with my commander and at the battlefield, I can just keep playing them over and over again. Um, Sensor Splicer, this is where I'm going to try and keep up with some of the, uh, you know, token decks and stuff like that, because every turn I can get myself a 3-3 Golem. Them having Vigilance is neither here nor there for me, really. It's more so that every turn for 4 mana, I'm getting a 3-3, and that's just basically free. It's e I can do it at end of turn um, if I need to, so it's a great way to keep up with creatures in this deck. Um, Coalition Honor Guard is actually probably one of the cards I'm most excited for. Um, it's really good because it says opponents. So if, if an opponent is choosing a target of a spell or an ability, it's going to target Coalition Honor Guard first. That automatically shuts down any of their ways to maybe get rid of Mist Meadow Witch. So they got a, you know, they've got targeted removal. Well, they have to get rid of Coalition Honor Guard first. And then on top of that, if it's something that buffs their creatures, hey, it's got to go to Coalition Honor Guard first, so it's going to buff mine instead. And then if it's something I don't like, bounce coalition honor guard and all of a sudden i still have that protection on the board for the next turn so it's just going to be a really good lockdown spell or, or creature to make sure that i have kind of my commander on the board because that's really a large part of my win um ghostly flicker is obviously in there to keep the bounce effects going but for instant bounce effects so it's not until end of turn um that's going to be really helpful for things like peregrine drake and uh, you know, if I need something right away, I need to draw those two cards before something really bad happens or I don't have necessarily enough mana to use Miss Meadow Witch. Stuff like that. And then probably the card that I'm most excited for because board wipes are very difficult to find in commons uh, at all. Fade Away is kind of a board wipe. It is for each creature, that creature's controller pays one or sacrifices a permanent. Now, they can start paying, you know, sacrificing their lands if it's later in the game and they'd rather keep their creatures. So that's one thing that would be kind of unfortunate in a late game popper. But it's one of the few board wipes that I found while doing my research and it's in blue, which is incredible. So anyway, those are kind of some of the cards that I'm looking forward to that I think are going to make Miss Widow Witch pretty formidable. Um, and I can actually can't wait to start building this deck up also might turn into a Zor, who knows. Drago! <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and we hope to see you in the game. There you go. Alright, hi there, everyone. Uh, today, my popper deck is, and I'm gonna move over to the right side, Juniper Order Ranger. Uh, this one of my favorite cards, my first combo deck, per se, when it came to EDH and stuff like that. Um, whenever uh, a creature comes into play, that creature gets a 1-1 one, one counter, and Juniper gets a 1-1 one, one counter. So, with the, the deck list I have, you can see why this will be very beneficial to me. Um, this is a way, it's a sack outlet. And it's a good sack outlet because it regenerates creatures. So, I can regenerate my general if someone attacks it or um, tries to get rid of it, destroy it, whatever, as long as I can regenerate it. Then, Persist. That's a big plus of this, this type of uh, deck with Juniper, is I sack a Persist creature, it gets a minus one counter when it comes back in, but it also gets a plus one, plus one, so it negates each other. So I can do this multiple times. Just, but I believe the rule with uh, the Popper, which we put in place, is you can only do a combo four times? I think so. I think that was part of the rules. But... Four, four times. 
times. Repeating a combo more than three times in one turn loses you one point per loop. Oh, okay. So we lose, yeah. So a lot we, of points if you go infinite. Yeah. <laughs> well, if I win the game, what, no, but I lose a lot of points. That's. <laughs> there and you go, you go negative. <laughs> you end up with zero points. At right. So, um, Sutra Priest. That's another one. When I'm doing this, I'm gaining life. And then it also works in the opposite with when my opponents put a creature in, they lose a life. So this could be, if they're doing a lot of tokens and things, this could stink. Um, Air knock. Bond. Pin. All right, uh, this is another thing that when it gets 1 1 counters, it affects things. All my creatures are going to have 1 1 counters, they all have first strike. Seems really, really good. And then Ori Umph. I can sack this creature and destroy, or actually deal damage to a, a flyer. So if they put any flyers out with Juniper, I can keep sacking this until I kill that flyer. So I mean, it, it can come in as a 4 4. I sack it, I do 4 damage. I sack it again, do three damage. If the flyer's over seven, uh, I'll do it again. I'm going to get rid of that flyer. Kilkin Spell Duster. Okay, here's another persist that gets rid of enchantments. Um, I noticed in our play group here, uh, we we play with enchantments, but no one really has anything to remove them. So I thought this seemed really good. Uh, Ivy Lane Denison. This is really good because if I play a green creature, I get to put a 1-1 one, one on any creature like that's out in play. So it all comes in, if I have a persist creature with a minus one counter already, I can get rid of that counter. Lawn Shot Squad. Here's another defensive four flyers. Um, it, any creature I have with a 1-1 one, one has reach. So there you go. And then back to my general. 